The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. This week, I'm pleased to have as my guest, Chris Cowell, an account executive and a hitting and catching instructor at On Deck Training uh, in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Chris played professional baseball in the Colorado Rockies organization and in the Independent Frontier League with the Traverse City Beach Bums. He was also an outstanding student athlete at the University of Richmond and Malvern Prep. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, having me tonight. Chris, you come from a, a baseball family. Your father, John, played at Lawrenceville Prep, was it, in New Jersey? Yes, in New Jersey, yep. And he also coached Little League and American Legion Ball. You have two mm-hmm. brothers who played uh, baseball at Conestoga High School. Um, yes. John, your older brother, John Jr., then went on and played at Shenandoah in Virginia, and your younger brother, Matt, at Dickinson College in Carlisle. And you've played both at the amateur and professional levels, and now you and your, your brother, John, operate a baseball training facility uh, on deck training in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania. Uh, did your father cultivate that love of baseball and, and all of his sons, or did it did it come naturally? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, we were just those kids, you know, the minute we got home from school, we were just outside playing sports. So um, I don't remember it being, you know, focused towards baseball. I mean, in the fall we played either soccer or football. Um, the wintertime, you know, we were big into basketball. Um and then in the spring, we played baseball. I do remember my dad was pretty into pitching, um, but it was more one of those things, you know, for fun. We were just always playing sports, um, and obviously later on, it kind of led to baseball. So was baseball really the first organized sport you played, or were you also involved in an organized basketball league or peewee football or soccer or something like that? Yeah, um, so I would say probably basketball and baseball were the first two I remember. Um, you know, like I said, we were as much a basketball family as we were a baseball family. Um, you know, I can remember playing CYO ball, um, you know, having a great time doing that, but we kind of always knew we were leaning towards, uh, baseball in the future, but yeah, when we were young, it was, you know, whatever, uh, season we were in we played that sport mm-hmm. well little league baseball is is the purest form of the game uh it, it it has a lot of life lessons it encourages sportsmanship teamwork hard work and healthy competition and you were fortunate to play in the berwin paoli little league program which really has many fine coaches and of course a great facility but in general so many of the kids who play Little League today never go on to play Legion or high school ball. Why is that? Um, I think it, it's a lot different than uh, when I was going through. I think nowadays the travel ball scene has kind of taken over. Um, when I was going through, I mean, you played Little League and then you played your tournament um, Little League season after that. And I don't even remember – you know, having travel teams before, um, you know, age 13 or 14. So I think now, um, you know, the travel's taken some of the better players, which, you know, I think is kind of hurting the little leagues where, you know, it seems like numbers are down as is with, you know, lacrosse um, getting pretty popular. But it seems like almost people have shifted towards, if you're a better player, playing the travel ball, you know, sometimes – playing travel ball and not even playing Little League, where, you know, when I was, I was going through, everyone played Little League, and then those better players um, ended up playing the tournament ball. But I just think it's a combination, you know, probably a little bit of, you know, lacrosse, uh, stealing some players, and then um, just the boom in travel baseball at the younger ages. So <clears throat> what you're telling me is that shift really more towards travel team baseball 
started in, you know, after 2000, because you were coming through this in the 1990s. I guess you graduated from Malvern Prep in 2008, uh, mm-hmm. and then you went on to Richmond. So a lot of this travel team stuff happened after 2000. Is that correct? Yes. I think uh, when I was 12 in the Little League was uh, 2002. So I would say it's probably been even, you know, the last five, seven years where, you know, you play for the travel team more than you play for the little league team, which again is a, is a big difference. And I think it just pulls more of the better players away from the little leagues. You know, if the games aren't as competitive, you know, kids kind of get bored with it, you know, now your little league's down to five or six teams instead of 10, 11, 12. You also had another major development during that time period in terms of Little League because Little League Baseball had the monopoly, and then Cal Ripken started Mm -hmm. an alternative, Cal Ripken Baseball. And not only did they start an alternative, but where some people had concerns about Little League Baseball, Cal Ripken addressed the primary concern, which was uh, hurting arms, young arms moving out of Little League at age 12 onto the big field at age 13. And Mm -hmm. the Cal Ripken, what Cal Ripken does is they gradually make that move to the big field. Um, How, you know, what are you seeing now uh, as you see people coming through on deck? Uh, Those kids that are 13, 14 years old, do you notice any real difference in in the abilities of uh, the kids that uh, came through Cal Ripken compared to those that played traditional Little League ball? Um, I think I do. I haven't seen quite as many, um, I guess, of the Cal Ripken, but even in Little Leagues now, the new thing is to play the 50-70, which I think is what Cal Ripken plays at the younger levels where um, you can take leads, you know, pitchers are holding runners, all that stuff, where I, I understand the idea, but it just seems like the kids haven't been coached on – where to be in you know in certain situations, how to hold runners, um, which is a lot at that age. You know, when I was 11 or 12, I don't even think I played a 50-70 game, um, so I wouldn't have had any idea. You know, how do you hold a runner at first base? What's the stretch? What's the wind up? So it seems like th- there has been a shift to playing more of that 50-70, kind of getting re- uh, ready for the big field. But um, you know, and the other thing is kids at that age aren't quite big enough to make some of those throws. I mean, a throw from deep shortstop as an 11 year old on the 50, 70, I mean, it's a pretty long throw. So um, I I do see some more, I can definitely tell the kids play a lot more um, than we did when we were younger. Um, But at the same time, it just seems like there's a little disconnect between playing on that field and really understanding what you're trying to do, where to be, all all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, you played your high school ball at at Malvern Prep, which has one of the finest programs in the nation. Malvern always seems to be in the uh, the hunt for the interacademic title every year, even during rebuilding years. It also has turned out many pro ball players, including Ben Davis, who caught with the San Diego Padres and the Mariners, Tim Cooney, who pitched for the St. Louis Cardinals, Phil Gosselin, an infielder for several teams, including the Braves, Diamondbacks, and Pirates, and you, uh, who played in the Colorado Rockies organization. To what do you attribute Malvern's overwhelming success in baseball? Um. I mean, I think it starts definitely at the top. Um, At the time I was there, um, Mike Hickey was the coach. He's actually at Episcopal. Uh, Now it's uh, Freddie Hilliard who does an awesome job. I think when I was a freshman, it was his first year as an assistant. So um, definitely the coach. I mean, those guys, you know, they're they're right on level with, you know, college coaches, and they kind of run that program like a college program. I mean, when I was there, I think my senior year we played 43 games, which that just doesn't happen at most high schools. But the other thing is there's an expectation of success there. I I knew, you know, when I went there, I'd heard all about Malvern Prep and guys like Ben Davis and stuff. And, you know, when you go in there, it's kind of like a college team where – you know, if you're not 
playing well or you're not producing, whether you're a junior, senior, whatever, there's somebody behind you that's, you know, probably the best player from his league growing up. So um, I think it, it was a combination of the coaches really ran it at a high level and we played really good teams all the time. Um, but at the same time, you were, you know, required to, to play well because if you didn't, you know, unlike a lot of high schools, you know, the next guy – was right there waiting to, waiting to take your spot. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the, the quality of coaching at, uh, at Malvern Prep. Uh, I noticed I was in baseball two separate periods of time coaching. Um, first, when I, I, I went into prep school education in the 1980s, and then I left in 98, and then I came back through when my son went through Little League and followed him all the way through and uh, and, and did uh, some Legion and, and travel baseball. Uh, and what I noticed during my second time through is that the coaches at the Legion level and the high school really counted on the on the teaching part of the game being done either by academies or by mm-hmm. the Little League that they did not spend as much time uh, Mm -hmm. doing the teaching part of of baseball, the skills, uh, and and developing the mechanics. Um, And and to me, from what I've seen at Malvern Prep, and especially with Hilliard, is that this guy's a teacher coach, and and his kids execute so well, Um, and, and they're disciplined. And, and that's a key. I think Malvern is more disciplined than any of the interact teams uh, that I have seen. Uh, mm-hmm. The only other coach that that I've seen who is as as uh, much of a teacher coach is um, Devon Prep's coach. God, his name just escapes me. Um, mm-hmm. Aquilani. Right, right. Who actually? Uh, um, Con Aquilani was in Burn Pilly back when you know my older brother John was going through. So that's. Kind of an interesting coincidence. Yeah, I've had I've had players from my travel team and Legion team who've gone on to play for him at Devon Prep, and they tell me they are exhausted by the end of his practice <laughs> because mm-hmm. it is nonstop, and they're not only physically exhausted, they are mentally exhausted because oh, yeah. he makes you think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know you'd expect that kind of. Uh, work out in basketball but not in baseball and it's a completely different uh approach to the game but one that benefits i mean look at uh devon preps and malvern preps record um Mm -hmm. you know over the last decade easily uh in and out of states i mean they're they're phenomenal teams Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. now you mentioned that you were uh, your family was really, and your own experience has not only been baseball, but growing up also in basketball. And mm-hmm. you earned four varsity letters in baseball at Malvern Prep, two in basketball. You were a two-time first-team selection in the Interacademic League. And in 2008, your senior year, you captained the baseball team and led the Friars to an Interact title. Uh, so you played both baseball and basketball. Uh, mm-hmm. which is becoming rare these days. I mean, there's so much right. pressure on these kids to specialize, and we see it especially in baseball. Looking yep. back, looking back, was it helpful to play multi-sports, or would you, if you were coming through today, just concentrate on baseball if you had to do it all over again? That's an interesting question. I look back, and I'm glad I stuck with basketball all the way through high school. Um, I just viewed that, you know, I had pressure from both sides. You know, I remember, like, my sophomore year, I think one of our coaches, you know, kind of approached me. He was like, you know, you, you might want to think about, you know, shutting down basketball and just getting ready for baseball. But I remember thinking at the time, it's like, if I – quit playing basketball like that's it like there's no more basketball games to play and for me I just enjoyed it like I looked forward to the winter and playing basketball getting you know baseball fun and all that but you don't get that excitement and energy that you know in some of the other sports 
You do. So just from an enjoyment standpoint, I wanted to keep playing basketball. Um, I remember, like, you know, Phil Goslin, he took his junior year off from basketball and then, you know, played really, really well as a junior and got um, attention after that. And I remember thinking, you know, there might be something to that, you know, just playing one sport. But um, I look back and I'm glad I kept playing. Um, I think especially when you're younger – Playing the other sports helps you develop as an athlete, where a lot of kids I see now, they're good baseball players, you know, they practice all the time, you know, which is all good, but they kind of lack a fluidity or a rhythm to a lot of the things they do, whether it's hitting, um, throwing, catching, fielding, all that stuff. I think basketball, you know, soccer, football, moving your feet and, you know, working in rhythm and working in a team um, I think those movements all help you in baseball. And, you know, I'll never forget, um, there was one day, you know, when I was in rookie ball with the Rockies, we went to, you know, the local YMCA, um, and there was, you know, probably 10, 12 guys there. We we're playing basketball one day, and I think almost every guy could dunk a basketball. So wow. um, I think at times people are convinced, hey, if I give everything up and concentrate on this, I'm guaranteed to – get a D1 scholarship or play pro ball, you always wish that happens. The reality is it may or may not. So, you know, if, if you're giving up another sport, you better be pretty sure you're, you know, done playing that because, again, there's no more games to play as as you get older. But at the same time, I think it helps guys develop rhythm, timing, fluidity, um, playing other sports than just baseball. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. My biggest concerns working with pitchers primarily about single-sport athletes, and particularly in baseball, is with pitchers because of repeat use injury. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and the other thing is the pressure now, the pressure was on you at, at the high school level back mm-hmm. in the 2000s. Well, today in in the 2010s, I mean, the pressure now – is on middle schoolers to choose right. one sport, and that's just not fair. Especially and I think it, it, part of the problem, I think, is the early recruiting because, I mean, I tell guys now, like, I committed in my senior year. If I had been going through now, you know, I don't know if I would have gone to a Division One, but because these scholarships are being offered so early, like you're saying, you know, if you're in seventh, eighth grade, you're already having to make that decision, which to me just seems a, a little out of whack. Yeah, but you bring up recruiting, which is leads me right into my my, my next set of questions, which is um, the whole college recruitment experience you had. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I was not a good enough athlete to to go through the recruitment uh, process, but as a high school coach and an American Legion and a tournament team coach, I've had players who've been recruited, and I know that there are a lot of a lots of pressure in the junior and senior years to capture the attention of a college recruiter and or a pro scout. And I also know that Division I recruiters in particular make promises that they can't always keep, uh, and mm-hmm. among them is a promise of scholarship money. Uh, a lot of listeners, and I hope there's a lot of dads listening to this in particular, at the D1 level, a head coach only has 11.7 full scholarships. At the D2 level, there are nine full scholarships per team. NAIA, which is the alternative to the National Association of uh, Intercollegiate Athletics, those schools have 12 scholarships. And fully funded junior colleges can offer up to 24 scholarships. But the coaches have to divide those scholarships, Mm -hmm. and they can do so any way they choose. What you're never told is that there are approximately 50,000 college baseball players out there who are competing for a limited number of scholarships. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a a huge issue that, that really has to be addressed in the recruitment process. Because I've I've had some players who've been promised partial scholarships, it never unfolds. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that is troubling to me is that it seems as the, today when the recruitment process unfolds, an exceptional athlete 
is going to find himself having to choose between MLB's amateur draft in college. Uh, mm-hmm. There are also pressures and expectations coming from recruiters, parents, high school coaches, and teammates on what you should do with your future. Having said all that, what was the recruitment process like for you coming out of Malvern, and, and how did you navigate some of the challenges that you faced? Yeah, um, I mean, we were just like everyone else, you know. I was lucky to have my older brother John go through it a little bit, but I was coming through right as, you know, perfect game and all the recruiting services were just starting to get popular. So um, I really, freshman, sophomore year, I didn't do any showcase stuff really. I remember played on a travel team called the Chester County Crawdads, which, you know, we had – pretty good group of guys, a couple guys ended up uh, playing professionally, but um, I didn't do team camps or, um, you know, any of the individual showcases at different schools. You know, I ended up playing um, for All-Star Baseball Academy when I was a junior, uh, in my junior summer. Um, And I was just like every other kid, you know, show up to the showcase, hope afterwards you get some texts and calls and, You know, by the end of the summer, you're committed to a D1. Um, Unfortunately, um, that didn't happen. I went into um, my senior year really not having any Division I offers. I had, you know, a lot of interest from D2s and D3s, um, but I didn't have, you know, any, you know, straight-up offer from a Division I baseball school. So it was kind of a tough spot because, you know, you're a senior, everyone's, kind of figuring out where they're going to school you know the signing day comes and goes I still don't know where I'm going um and I I really lucked out and I'm still um very grateful today that my coach Mike Hickey at Malvern um was great with the recruiting process and you know you go into his office he get right on the phone call schools for you um make you sound great not that you know he was embellishing or anything but just really make you feel like you could play at those schools um and get the coaches interested in you so basically for me i had some interest here and there um i remember liking richmond i went to a winter camp down there as a senior i actually missed um a basketball game for it um for malvern um went down there still There was interest, but nothing offered. And then uh, I think it was actually April of my senior year, um, Coach Hickey, I I guess Richmond was playing Temple at the time. We were playing um, at Latchaw in Norristown. Coaches from Richmond came afterwards, um, had a pretty good game. And then, you know, within a week or two, um, actually Coach uh, Ryan Wheeler, who's at St. Joe's, you know, offered me a spot. with Richmond, but that wasn't again until uh, April of my senior year, which is crazy to think now. You know, if you're not signed as a senior, it's you'd have trouble, you know, finding spots at a Division One school. Mm-hmm. Well, now at a time when these recruiters are going down to the freshman and sophomore level, which I personally think is absurd because there's a lot of growing and development that needs to be done and is going to be done. Uh, There's a tremendous difference between the skill set of a freshman baseball player and what he's going to be like in his senior year. And Mm -hmm. I simply don't think that you could project, uh, you know, what a player is going to be in his freshman year. Uh, So I, I simply don't understand why, the recruiters are going down to that level, but they're doing it. So mm-hmm. having said that and having gone through the experience that you have, have gone through, what is some of the best advice that you can give to a kid going through this process today? I would say I know it's tough. Um, sometimes people don't like to hear it, but don't get so tied into the level. I mean, everyone wants to play Division One baseball. There is a ton – and I realized as I got older playing in summer leagues in college with some of these guys, a ton of Division Two and Division Threes, um, especially in the South, that are very good programs, get guys drafted all the time. Um, 
I think sometimes people get in trouble. They get really fascinated with, hey, I want to go D1. I want to go D1. And it almost overshadows, well, do you like the school? You know, do you like the coach? You know, say you had an injury and you couldn't play anymore, would you be okay just going to school as a student um, at the school you're looking at? So I know at times people don't like hearing that. Um, you know, it's great to go Division One. I. I had a great experience and all that, but that's probably the biggest tip I could give people. When you're looking at the school, again, you want to play at a really good program, that's great, but make sure, you know, the school itself is a good fit for you. And and I was lucky with Richmond. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't have got in academically without some baseball help, but I liked that school, liked the campus, um, and it was a really good fit for me. So um, that's probably the best advice I could give. You know, try and look at it from the whole picture, not just the baseball side of it. That's great advice. Um, as, as you said, you went on to the University of Richmond, and the Spiders have a pretty prestigious Division One program. You were a four-year starter at catcher there and also a three-time All-Atlantic 10 conference selection. In 2012, your senior year, you were first team, all East region, second team, all state, that is Virginia, and ranked second in the nation in home runs with 20. And you still, I, I believe you still hold fourth place on the Spiders' all-time career home run list with 45. Is, is that correct? Are you still there? Uh, I think so. I'd have to check, but I, I think so. Yeah, as as of last summer you were because I checked it with a current player, and uh, oh, yeah. he had known of you, and I brought up the name, and he, he lit up, and he said, man, the guy's a monster. <laughs> you were one <laughs> heck of a hitter there. Um, but you also had a baptism by fire at Richmond. That is, mm-hmm. you had to make the transition from third base to catcher and to do so on at the D1 level. Mm-hmm. Talk about some of the challenges that are involved in that. That couldn't have been easy. No, it was tough. And, I mean, at Malvern, you know, I grew up catching. Um, but at Malvern, I I basically just struggled defensively. It wasn't one of those things like, hey, you know, we're not trying to play, you know, Chris at catcher. I was, you know, I would drop balls. Balls would get through me. Um and I would say I was just kind of like a nervous catcher, which ne- never never works too well. But I was really lucky at Richmond. I had, you know, probably to this day the best catching coach I've ever come across. Um, and his name was Chad Oxendine. He played at Coastal, been with the White Sox. Um, I think he coached at Alabama before he came to Richmond. Um, and I remember going to the camp I had told you about, and he put us – through this catcher's workout where I'm not kidding, I was sore for an entire week after we did that. And I remember when it came to making the decision to go to Richmond, part of me almost went, I don't know if I can make it through those guys' workouts. Like I might go to a different school just so I don't have to do the catching workout. But um, he helped me so much because, I mean, we were going at 6 a.m., in the fall, in the morning, and his, you know, kind of the line he used with us was, you know, we're going to be the hardest working catchers in the country. And I remember, you know, thinking, yeah, everyone kind of says that, and, you know, that sounds good. And after, you know, two, three work, I mean, he just put us through the ringer. But, um, you know, what ended up happening, by the end of the fall um, and definitely by the spring, I felt ready and comfortable, which – was a great feeling because anybody that's caught, you know, you'll know the feeling of, you know, stress before a game or anxiety where you don't feel comfortable back there. And now, you know, instead of catching guys that are 82, 83, now you're catching guys 88 to 92. So um, I have to give a lot of credit um, to Coach Oxendine because he really turned me from, you know, like I said, a, a nervous catcher and not having – um, that much confidence defensively to, you know, basically catching 30 games as a freshman where, you know, I'd only caught a handful of games at uh, Malvern to that point. Mm-hmm. Now, Chris, I've known you probably five or six years now through your coaching of, of my son, Peter, uh, who went to, to Penn Charter. And uh, I know that you're a pretty humble person, so you're going to have to indulge me 
while I boast about some of your personal highlights uh, in college because they are impressive. And, and they include in your freshman year, that was 2009, your freshman year debut against Niagara. You collected three hits, a homer, and a career high, I guess up to that time, uh, five RBIs. In uh, your sophomore year, you hit 11 home runs, and that was just an 8-10 competition, which tied you for the league, uh, lead, and that's just as, just as a sophomore. Uh, then in your junior year, um, in a 10-3 route of Dayton, you went 3-for-4 with a double-triple, four RBIs, and that game helped the Spiders avoid elimination in the 8-10 tournament. And then your senior year, probably the most outstanding game, was the, the first one of that season against St. Peter's when you went three for five with two home runs, a double, six RBI, and three runs scored. Uh, not too shabby. <laughs> you know, pretty impressive <laughs> highlights there. Uh, Good hitters park. Good hitters park. Well, hey, you know what? <laughs> they're, they're personal achievements, and you should be proud of them. Uh, which one of these achievements, or any other that I didn't mention, mean the most to you, and why? Um, it's actually interesting, the ones you listed, because there's almost like different stages, and, and each of those were, were awesome. Um, you know, the freshman year game, again, that was my first start. That was pretty cool, because regardless of what anybody says, you know, before your first college game, I mean, I was – so nervous, you know, hoping things go well. And to have a game, you know, where you get your first hit out of the way, first home or all that stuff, it just kind of, you know, made me feel like, hey, you know, I can play here because, again, I was, you know, the last guy recruited in my class. So just to have that game where you're like, you know, I'm all right, I, I'll, I'll be okay here, that that was pretty cool. Um, and then anytime, you know, you have a big game in the tournament um, because, you know, once you get to be a junior and senior, it's you really, you know, you want to win a championship. When you're younger, you're just trying to get on the field, do the best you can. Um, but as a junior and senior, you kind of see the door closing a little bit. You want to win, um, the you know, that championship. So, um, you know, the game against Dayton, that was a, a lot of fun to play well and then, you know, get back to the championship game um, as a result. Mm-hmm. You were selected in the 34th round in the 2012 June amateur baseball draft by the Colorado Rockies. We all hear that once a ball player gets to the pro level, everyone is just as talented. What determines your success or your work ethic and the opportunities you receive? And part of that is also a function of just plain good luck. Um, that's what at least other major leaguers and professional players tell me. Did you find that to be true in your case? Uh, I did. I, it's, you know, you know, when you make the jump from middle school to high school, high school to college, um, college to pro, it, it's similar things where, you know, the ball's moving faster, the guys are bigger, you know, everybody can run, um, everyone was first team all conference. Um, so all those things are definitely true. I mean, there isn't really anyone in professional baseball that you come across that doesn't do something, whether it's, you know, on the mound, velocity, you know, power at the plate, um, you know, in the field defensively, everybody can do something that kind of jumps out at you. And that's, you know, looking back, that's kind of the thing you always remember is that, you know, these guys, you know, everyone comes through rookie ball. So whether it's a major leaguer or, you know, a guy that doesn't make, you're seeing all the talent right in front of you. So um, it, it was, you know, I, I always say, and, you know, people ask me about, you know, playing with certain guys. And, you know, I always talk about David Dahl, who made his uh, debut last year, I think, you know, he tied um, the longest hitting streak to open a major league career. Um, and, you know, David was the first kid I saw in person that, you know, the only word I could use, and it's kind of funny using it on a kid that's three, four years younger than you, like, you know, the kid is just greatness on a baseball field. I mean, I don't know if he knew how he did this stuff, but, you know, kid's 18 years old, 
hitting 380 um, against 21 and 22 year olds, and that was that's the stuff you know playing against a guy like Corey Seager, kids 18 years old, six foot four, plays shortstop, and you know just destroys the ball. So you just start to see guys that you know it's almost like wow, is he just born to play baseball? Because they do things you know sometimes without even thinking that you've just never seen um, before the professional level. Mm-hmm. How how meaningful was it to play professional baseball for you, Chris? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was a, a great experience. I would say the day I got drafted, that was you know, probably one of the coolest days um, of my life because, again, as a junior, um, you know, after having a pretty good sophomore year, you know, people are looking at me to go – you know, pretty high in the draft, and, you know, I ended up just, you know, not playing really well as a junior, um, was dealing with a little bit of uh, uh, arm injury, but it just wasn't a good year for me. And I remember kind of halfway through my junior year realizing that, you know, draft's probably not going to happen, you know, all these bad thoughts going through my head. You know, I, for, you know, a day or two, I was kind of like, well, you know, gave it a shot, you know, played in college, you know, professional thing might might just not work out um but then you know a day or two after that i was kind of like you know what let's let's just bear down we'll work as hard as we can um for the next year and a half because i knew it'd be you know a little bit tougher trying to get drafted as a senior um and i just you know worked my tail off from the end of my junior season um pretty much right through the day i got drafted so that was a cool feeling of that hard work really paying off and just having a day where, Hey, you know, you did it. You went from, you know, Southeastern Pennsylvania played college ball, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're going to sign a professional contract. So that was a pretty cool, like full circle uh, moment in in playing baseball for me. And it puts you in rarefied crowd. I mean, we're talking about probably single percentage that will make it that far um, mm-hmm. in 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 baseball when you consider all the all the kids, the teens, um, the young adults that play the game. Uh, so mm-hmm. it, it is pretty impressive. And we've talked about this before. There comes a time when the game tells every ball player that it has no more use for him on on the playing mm-hmm. field. And for me, that time came during my sophomore year at a D3 college. So I pretty much channeled my passion into coaching uh, the sport and, and writing about it. I know you played in the Independent Frontier League after you were released mm-hmm. by the Rockies. You also played and starred in the Delco League. How much baseball do you have left in you, Chris? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I'm just – like every other guy where, you know, being on the field, it's your favorite thing to do. And and that's the thing, as you get older, and I guess it's when you put in all the time and hard work, you know, when I was younger, you kind of always take, you know, playing sports for granted and all that stuff. But as I got older, you start to realize, you know, just being on the field and, and playing and catching and all that stuff, um, it's just what you really like to do. So, you know, for me, I mean, I'll, I'll always get back on the field, whether it's, you know, in a league around here or wherever, um, just because, you know, you just have that love of hitting and, you know, being on the field with the team. So um, I hope I can I can play and, you know, been lucky enough not to have any serious injuries and all, and all that, but um, it's just one of those things you don't, you don't get that feeling um, from too many other things. So, uh We'll, we'll see how the body holds up, but but I'll try and get out there um, as long as I can. Well, you you're also uh, an exceptional teacher, coach, and and you're working out of on deck training in Newtown Square these days, uh, which you operate with your brother John. Uh, tell mm-hmm. us about that organization and its mission. Yes, yeah, so. Um, John actually took over as the full-time manager about three years ago. Um, the owner's name is uh, Matt O'Reilly. Um, he had a son, um, still at Episcopal, a junior at Episcopal, but um, he built the facility uh, in March of 2014 and, you know, was just looking for some guys with a uh, professional background to the baseball side of things. And, 
it is a gorgeous facility. I mean, I've probably been in hundreds of these over the years, and, you know, they just did a phenomenal job um, when they first built it. So the facility is, you know, top-notch. Um, as far as, you know, the baseball side and what we look to do, um, you know, we do a lot of private instruction. Like we talked about, we'll probably be getting into the teams um, in the near future. But our goal really is just to give good information, Um you know, the game of baseball has allowed me a ton of opportunities to travel and meet people um, and do a lot of cool things that, you know, without baseball I probably wouldn't have gotten to do. So I always feel um, definitely a debt to baseball to give back um, and, and help guys. You know, I primarily do a lot of, of the catching stuff, but we're we're more so just looking to teach the game, the fundamentals, you know, get kids thinking and understanding the game um, so as they get older and progress, um, you know, they know they know what they're doing out in the field and, you know, hopefully have a good time doing it. What, what plans do you have for on deck in the future? Uh, tournament teams, expansion of the facility, summer camps. Uh, I realize you're kind of moving in the summer camp uh, direction and also coaching coaches. Um, mm-hmm. so what, what else is, is, uh, in the future? Yeah, I think definitely, um, you know, teams probably by, uh, you know, next fall or so, I would think, um, just because that, you know, with a lot of these facilities, you know, to have a team that that's, you know, good exposure for, you know, what you're trying to do and, you know, the things you're teaching. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. Um, we actually expanded the facility, this it was the winter of 2015 to 16 added four more cages so we got a nice um big space now for teams to work out but um kind of like you were saying i think we'll start shifting more towards um you know in the 13 to 15 year old age group doing some travel teams you know helping these guys get comfortable on the big field well, Chris, we got to close, but before we do, I want to make a shameless plug for On Deck. Uh, I can vouch for that Always organization. No, uh, my my son Peter, uh, his game moving from the sophomore to the junior year in high school just vastly improved. His whole learning curve shot up when he met you and started working out with you both uh, at catcher and and as a hitter. His game just skyrocketed, and you were one of the very best coaches he – teacher coaches, I should say, ever ever had. And I've also seen uh, some of the other instructors you have there. Uh, John, I mean, he's worked with some of my players, lower-level lower, uh, lower level players. Um, you know, I, I've, I've seen some of your pitching coaches. Uh, you know, some of you guys have worked with – uh, the Special Olympics athletes, the, mm-hmm. the kind of challenger uh, team that I have, and all you guys, you're patient, you're knowledgeable, you know the game, you know how to teach it. So, listeners, this is uh, this is a place to go and and check out on deck in Newtown Square. Um, Chris, thanks for being with us. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks uh, for having me on. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to another podcast of Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. This is Bill Cachetis, uh, round third and head for home on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network.